Psalm 100 from the King James Version says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Welcome to the Berry Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let us worship the Lord God of Heaven together. Hello everyone, and welcome to another Family Life Nugget. As always, I'd like to invite you to join us on Wednesday evenings for our social chat. And you could uh, meet with us via Zoom on the church's uh, Zoom account. Um, whether you are part of a family unit or you're a single person, we'd love to hear from you. We are all part of God's family and we would love to check in on you and see how you're doing and just stop by and say hello to us. We will really appreciate that. Today's nugget is about anger and what to do about it. We all have had times in our lives when someone or something has angered us. It may be a family member who has hurt you, a child, a loved one who disappointed you, or maybe even someone at church. You may even be feeling anger towards God because the answer to that prayer did not come the way you want it. If you are feeling angry or when you experience these emotions, don't be discouraged. God does not condemn you and his word has encouragement for you. James wrote in James 1, 19, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak and slow to anger. He isn't saying that anger is wrong. Of course, we're going to get angry. That's just part of our creation package. Essentially, James just said, don't be quick tempered. This same sentiment was shared by the Apostle Paul, who told the Ephesians about the same thing. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger in Ephesians 4.26. Like James, he was realistic. After all, anger is part of life. It is an emotional response we were created with and unfortunately cannot be turned on and off at will. The main point here is to be cautious and aware. Don't let your anger carry you into sin. In these passages and many others, the Bible is basically saying to lead a balanced life. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 19, 11, a man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. A balanced life gives a sense of discretion, and it is a mark of wisdom to be able to overlook perceived transgressions. Solomon wrote one of the great principles of balanced living. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city, in Proverbs 16, 32. As we can see throughout scripture, the issue is not anger, but how much it controls us. Being slow to anger is a mark of strength, mastery, and leadership. Self-control or ruling your spirit brings more leadership and success than being able to capture a city. Wow. Finally, Paul told the Christians in, in Ephesus, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. That was taken from Ephesians 31, um, sorry, Ephesians 4, 31 to 32. When we see the warning light of anger flashing on our dashboard, we don't have to react in this 
fear or recoiling guilt. Just repent of it, reject it, and walk away from it. Seek wise counsel in dealing with the issue below the hood. You will find that most of them are resolved through forgiveness. Thank you so much for listening to today's nugget. And as always, please stay connected to our Heavenly Father and to each other. Until I see you again, have a happy Sabbath. Today's topic is, how are we treating our children? In 1924, the League of Nations adopted the Geneva Declaration, an historic document that for the first time recognized and affirmed the existence of rights specific to children and the responsibility of adults towards them. The United Nations, founded after World War II, took over the Geneva Declaration in 1946. However, following the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, the advancement of rights revealed the shortcomings of the Geneva Declaration, and it had to be expanded. On November 20th, 1959, the Declaration of the Rights of the Child was adopted unanimously by all 78 member states of the United Nations General Assembly in Resolution 1386, Part 14. This marked the first major international consensus on the fundamental principles of children's rights. The new document laid down these 10 principles. Number one, the right to equality without distinction on account of race, religion, or national origin. Number two, special protection for the child's physical, mental, and social development. Number three, the right to a name and a nationality. Number four, to adequate nutrition, housing, and medical services. Number five, to special education and treatment when a child is physically or mentally handicapped. Number six, to understanding and love by parents and society. Number seven, to recreational activities and free education. Number eight, to be among the first to receive relief in all circumstances. Number nine, to protection against all forms of neglect, cruelty, and exploitation. And number 10, the right to be brought up in a spirit of understanding, tolerance, friendship among peoples, and universal brotherhood. On October 22, 2018, a new University of California Riverside study found that children are sensitive to and suffer the impacts of discrimination as young as seven years old. The study suggested that a strong sense of ethnic racial identity is a significant buffer against these negative effects. Four years before, the United Nations Children's Fund, in its report called Hidden in Plain Sight, a statistical analysis of violence against children, stated that mental violence is often described as psychological maltreatment, mental, verbal, and emotional abuse, or neglect. This can include all forms of persistent, harmful interactions with a child. Some of the examples of this mental violence are favoritism, denying emotional responsiveness, name-calling, humiliating, belittling, ridiculing, or hurting a child's feelings. Many of these examples are components of the discrimination that is rooted in racism. As we consider our behavior as Christians, we may believe that we don't discriminate and that we aren't racist, but do we have an unconscious bias? Do we favor one thing, person or group 
over another in a way that could be considered not only unfair, but unchristian. We're not born understanding the concept of favoritism. This is something that we learn. In a church setting, what does it say about us if we tend to sit only with those of our ethnic background? What does it say if we use words like those people and our kind? What does it say when we deny emotional responsiveness to devastating stories that are in the news? What does it say if we judge a child by the color of his or her skin? Christian, sorry, children's experiences are in the hands of those around them. But what did children experience in the hands of Jesus? In Mark 10, 13 to 16, we read this loving story. Then people brought little children to Jesus that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms and he laid his hands on them and he blessed them. End of passage. Let's make certain children are as safe in our hands as they would be if Jesus was holding them as he held the children in those villages so long ago. As always, the choice is ours. Amen. Shayna here and welcome back to Kids Corner. I'm so happy to be able to spend this time with you all today. Have you ever been in a good mood and then bam, something happens that throws your whole day off? Maybe you got a bad mark on a test or you received some awful news or maybe you got in trouble with your mom or dad. There are so many things that can make us feel grumpy and upset and like nothing ever goes our way, even if you wanted to. We all feel like this sometimes. We feel like we have everything under control one minute and we're scrambling to hold our lives together the next. 
Unfortunately, we can't control everything in our lives, so we're bound to have days like this. But don't let these days make you lose hope. Even when nothing is going according to plan, God is still watching over you and taking care of you. You might not understand why something is happening, but God knows, and he always does the best for us. So we can trust that everything will work out in the end. The Bible gives us a beautiful reminder of what we should do in situations just like that. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul, who is one of Jesus' many followers, said, I have learned in whatever situation I'm in to be content. The Bible is reminding us that no matter what is going on in our lives, we can still be content. And to be content means to be satisfied or to be peacefully happy. When we have Jesus in our lives, we know that he's looking out for us and that he wants the best for us so we can be truly content. We can be assured that no matter what trial we're facing or how big and scary and confusing the things in our lives are, God still sees us and he loves us. And because of this, we can be content. We will still face problems and these problems may not go away for a really long time but we can be content because we know that we are safe with God no matter what we're going through. We've come to the end of our Kids Corner today, so we're going to close our eyes, sit quiet, and talk to Jesus. Dear Jesus, thank you that no matter what is going on in our lives, you are there to keep us safe and to protect us. Thank you that no matter what challenge we face, we can be content because we know that you will be working everything out for us in the end. Help us to depend on you in every situation. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for listening to Kids Corner today, and bye for now. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'm so glad you could join us for this hour of praise and worship. And now we're going to read scriptures and share a little bit about the Word of God and what God has in store for you. I was seven years old when uh, we went to the store. It was a place where they would pretty much sell everything, you know, superstore, a supermarket. And we were there, it was the first time my dad turned around and said to me, you can pick anything, ask anything and I will give it to you. You can go look at the store and anything you want I will I will buy for you it was the first time I have ever heard such words I was seven years old and I was looking around what should I buy what should I ask for and I knew I couldn't ask for anything super expensive we want um, I I was self-aware at the time and I was looking around what should I buy what should I buy I can ask anything I want and as a seven-year-old kid I looked at one painting and I said okay I want this for my wall and that's what I asked for I asked for a painting um, and I uh, that's what uh, I asked for and that's what my dad bought and I was able to put that in my room again I I'm not sure looking it back if it was the <laughs> If it was the best thing I could have asked for, of course I could have asked for so many other things like toys or even a, a video game or something else. Uh, but I, I remember that that painting spoke to me, and um, and that's it. But you know, God is asking us, just like my my father did, and of course uh, that was um, he asked me. Um, some other years later and I I'm not sure it was much a better decision uh, that I made then but that drawing was, was was very special to me I have it until today and because it meant something but God is asking of us what do we want ask and I will give it to you uh, we see uh, the context of that in John 15 so let's open the Word of God to John chapter 15 and let's understand the context of what uh, God is saying ask anything and I will provide to you as we open the Word of God to John 15 let us pray dear God dear Heavenly Father 
uh, we're going to open your word. Help us understand what it means to ask anything and that you will provide for us. Mold our hearts and be with us at this moment so we can understand the message for us today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So John chapter 15. And again, this is um, a section of the book where Jesus was speaking with the disciples. Of course, this is in the context of the Last Supper. As Jesus is speaking with the disciples, Jesus had washed their feet and they're now um, at this uh, place where they're eating, they're sitting at the table, and then Jesus speaks about the Holy Spirit. So chapters uh, 14, 15, and 16 has to do with the Holy Spirit. And as we see, uh, he repeats in chapter, uh, at the end of 15, in chapter 16, uh, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so 15 is inside this context of Holy Spirit that he speaks of in chapters 14 and chapter 16. And we do know that Jesus is bringing the temple imageries here, uh, especially in the Gospel of John. John is... Um, it's really emphasizing this point that Jesus is better than the temple itself. So all the Jews, they put their trust in the temple itself. And John makes a point to illustrate and to show that Jesus came not only to reform the temple, but to illustrate and demonstrate to them that he was the new temple. He was um, the Messiah they were expecting and they were forgetting about this and they were looking at the temple for salvation but the temple only pointed to Jesus Christ himself and his sacrifice and above the colonnades and uh, at the facade of the temple right at the uh, the top section of the temple you could see uh, vines you could see you know grapes you could see the vine there and that was one of the uh, decorations of the temple. And Jesus brings that up. And in 15, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Again, this in contrast with uh, what the temple had to offer. He is the true vine and not the temple itself. Of course, the uh, the disciples understood Jesus is speaking in so many other instances here in contrast with the temple. So I'm sure they understood this. Also, they understood what it meant to be uh, a gardener, right? What it meant to be a farmer. Um, they were in this context where uh, people would rely on produce and they would see this day to day. So they understood very well, um, you know, what it meant to have a vine to produce fruit and Jesus says I am the true vine and my father is the gardener now remember um, at the end of chapter 14 the last verse says so that the world may know that I love the father and I do as the father commanded me uh, get up and let's uh, leave this place so they're they're walking, they're leaving the place, and I'm sure they're walking, and they and now they uh, they see the temple, and that's why Jesus is contrasting here, um, saying that He is the true vine. In contrast, with what they're seeing, they're looking at the temple, and they're seeing the vines, decorations in the facade the, of the temple there. Now, verse two: Every branch in me that does not produce fruit he removes and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you remain in me and I in you just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine neither can you unless you remain in me I am the vine you are the branches the one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because, because you can do nothing without me. 
If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them in the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. If, remember the condition here, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it shall be done for you. My Father is glorified in this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. So ask anything and shall be given to you. That's what Jesus said. But what does that mean? Can I ask anything? I want three cars. I want a uh, million dollar house. What, what can we ask? And that's uh, very important for us to understand. Again, this is in the context of the Holy Spirit. And in the context of us being connected with God. If we remain in Him... Um, he will provide the desires of our hearts. And in this, the Father will be glorified. Now, Jesus repeats this so the disciples could understand. So verse 9, uh, he repeats it in a different way. Let's look at that. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love i have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete god wants us to be happy he wants us to be glad and and with our hearts full of joy he wants us to be complete and to be able to do that we need to remain in him and his words as well and if we do that Jesus is saying that is the love, right? As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. I have told you these things, verse 11. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Again, look at the condition. Um, I do not call you servants anymore because a servant does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. I'm going to repeat this last verse. I appointed you to go and produce fruit. And that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Again, remember, if you are connected with God, if you're connected with the vine, you are the branches, he is the vine, and you will produce fruit if you're connected with him. So go and produce fruit. And as we are connected with the vine, then we're able to ask the Father anything in his name, and he will provide for us. This is what I command you, verse 17. Love one another. Again, this is from the Gospel of John. This, this is Jesus' words um, itself here as we see uh, in John 15. Paul understood this. Paul understood what this meant. Let's look at Galatians 5. Galatians 5 says the following. Galatians 5 verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love so Paul understood that the fruit of the Spirit is love if we're connected to the vine if we're connected with him the first thing you should see is love love to the point of giving your life for someone love to the point of forgiveness love to the point of being connected and we see that if we are connected with the vine, 
we should be producing these fruits. Now the first one of these is love, then joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now if the spirit is there, of course the, the flesh waves, um, wages against the spirit. Of course our bodies, our sinful bodies are waging against the spirit. But if we're connected with the vine, we will be able uh, to not do what the flesh desires. Now, what the, des the flesh desires, the desires of the flesh is against the spirit, verse 17. So, 5, 17. And the spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under this obligation anymore you're not doing what the flesh wants but you're doing what the spirit wants and there's a list of course here of what is the desires of the flesh we know very well what the desires of the flesh is but notice that if we are connected we should be able to see those fruits and we should be able to delight on these fruits love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control if for any reason you're lacking in any one of these items any one of these fruits of the spirit please ask the lord remain and abide in him so you can have the fruit of the spirit so you can be connected with him and demonstrate the love that only comes from him now the law is not against such things in verse 24 now those who belong to christ jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires again remember anything that does not produce fruit is cut off from uh, the vine and is thrown into the fire if you're not producing these fruits be careful so you're not thrown aside and thrown through the fire as we see here now those who belong to Christ have crucified the fruit there's a price to pay of course uh, those fruits that are not good and as we see that there's fruits of the the flesh there's the works of the flesh we should we have to remove them if they're part of our lives and uh, they're going to spoil the rest of it you should be able to cut that down uh, so that the fruits can be visible it can be there so crucify the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another, but again, love one another. May we stay connected with the vine. May you choose today to ask anything the Lord will give you. So what does that mean? Ask and he will provide. Of course, if you're connected with the vine, if you obey his commandments, uh, you will be able to enjoy the will of God, what he has for you. And what God has for you today is for you to be able to enjoy the fruits of the Spirit. For you to be able to have love, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Because against these things, there's no law against these things. And if you're connected with him, you'll be able to ask uh, these spiritual things and he will provide. Of course, you may ask about physical things, you may ask about health items, but God wants to provide today the most important thing, which is a true relationship with him and the love that he has to provide. Let us pray. Dear God, be with us as we love one another and we ask you for love. May the Holy Spirit be upon us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you today.